Welcome to Discover Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us. As you're tuning in, make sure to let us know where you're tuning in from. We have an entire team that's dedicated to interact with you throughout our time together. Now, we had three tips that we went over last week to make the most of our time together. If you're new, we're gonna go over those again. And if you're tuning in again from last week, you may be a little bit like me and you could use a refresher. So here's our three tips. Number one, be fully present. Man, those notifications add up, don't they? And we wanna encourage you to stay on this screen. After all, those notifications, yep, they'll be there when we're all done. Number two, comment and share. The awesome thing about the online experience is that we can actually interact more than ever before. So if you have a question or you have a comment, maybe even an amen, make sure that you type that in the chat box so that we can all interact together. And then after our time, if you want to share that on your social media profiles, we would love for you to be able to do that. And then our third tip is to worship, don't just watch. We're going to have opportunities to be able to engage and worship together, to sing some songs of praise. We're going to share a story of impact happening right here in our Kansas City community. And we're going to hear an inspiring message and open up the Word of God. So make sure that you're engaging with us and you're not just sitting back. Now, we are going to move into a time of worship. Are you ready to lift up the name of Jesus? Let's get started. Hey, Discover, so glad that you could join us here right now. Man, what an opportunity it is for us to gather together again as the church and to worship together. And man, what an opportunity it is for us to spend some time with you today. I want to encourage you, This or last week when we started off our services, we talked about uh, worship. And we talked about uh, worship isn't something that you can receive nourishment for. Your soul can't receive nourishment just by watching other people do it. It's almost like eating. You can't receive nourishment for your body by watching somebody else eat. So when we worship today, when we sing these songs, I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, whether you're in your living room or your car or your office, whether you're sitting down or you want to stand up on your feet, whatever you want to do to engage with God this morning, I want to encourage you to do so. But I want to encourage you to open your mouth and to sing. There's going to be something that happens on the inside of you as you declare God's promises and His praises. Something happens to the inside of each one of us. Faith grows. It builds It helps us believe even more who He is. The rest of the world right now is speaking doom. They're speaking fear. They're speaking worry, uncertainty. But man, God doesn't speak any of those things. God speaks certainty. God speaks truth. He speaks life. He speaks love. So this morning, I want to encourage you to press into that. I want to encourage you to press into what He has to say to you today. I want to start off reading this scripture. It's out of Hebrews 6, and it says this. It says, And now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. This is where we find his strength and comfort. For he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time, an unshakable hope. We have this certainty, hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. I mean, that's what we're going to sing this morning. Everything that we're singing is speaking directly to hope. Hope of a future, hope of a past and what God did for us. So as we sing these songs together, I want to encourage you to open your mouth, let's sing together and let's lift the name of Jesus.
can see it The clouds are clear and everyone hears it The sound of hope, freedom is rising Glory is falling The lost are returning home There will be singing and there will be dancing Jesus, our hope is here The sound of the hurting will turn to rejoicing On that day, I know that you're coming again Praises are rising, spirit is moving, our future is here and now. Yeah. There will be singing and there will be dancing, Jesus our hope is here. The sound of the hurting will turn to rejoicing on that day. I know that you're coming again. The God of it. 
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. worshiping with us. Before we move on any further, I want to make sure that we give a big welcome to anybody who is joining us for the first time. So everybody, let's give them a big virtual Discover Church welcome. If this is your first time, we would love for you to text the word welcome to the number on your screen. We'd love to be able to send you a digital connect card, get some information from you because we have a gift for you. We may be social distancing, but we can still stay connected. And I don't know about you, but I need connection now more than ever. As we move into our giving portion of our service, all of this is going to be done online. And we appreciate your generosity because your generosity is making an impact now in our city more than it ever has. If you're wanting to give today, you can click the Give button in your browser or you can text the number on your screen. I want to take a little bit of time today to share a story of impact with you, of hope that's happening right here in our Kansas City community through a couple here at Discover Church. We have a couple who has been hosting game nights. Yep, that's right, still hosting game nights online. They are using what they have in this season to be able to build and create community right where they are. This is providing so much connection and community at a time where we can feel alone and isolated. So we are so excited to see these stories of impact that are happening right here in our community and right here at Discover Church. 
We do want to let you know if you're thinking, man, I could do that, or how could I do that? We're going to be equipping you with some resources this week on ideas of building community online right now in this season. So if you're not following Discover Church on Facebook or Instagram, make sure you do so so that you can look for those posts this week. Now, Go get your Bibles, maybe refill your coffee, and enjoy this inspiring message from our pastor, Jernigan Schwinn. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Discover Online. I am so thankful that you are tuning in from wherever you are tuning in from. Make sure you let us know. Uh, Give us a comment. Where are you watching from? Both like geographically, but also like physically, are you on? You know, are you watching on your phone, on your couch, or in your room, or whatever? Uh, we want to be able to connect with you, engage with you, and interact with you. So glad that you are here with us today. I want to want to share with you something that's really kind of exciting. And so I, I don't know what you do when you celebrate exciting news, um, but I want you to get yourself ready. I don't know if it's the clapping of hands or if it's the woot woot or uh, whatever that is. But this is our second week of doing Discover Online. And I just want to share with you something really exciting that even in this this new thing, and we're learning kind of as we go here, but even in this new thing, God is at work. You've heard me say that over and over again, that the mission is still the same, that we want to see our city changed by Jesus one life at a time. And so get yourselves ready to celebrate because last week we had somebody pray to receive Christ and commit their life to him. So man, come on. Hoot and holler, clap your hands. If you're watching with somebody, give them a high five. Man, that is awesome. It is amazing to see what God is doing in our city and right here through our church. Hey, listen, if you are the parent of a little one, specifically a school-aged or younger little one, I want to let you know about something really cool. Go to our uh, new Discover Kids Instagram account, at DiscoverKidsKC. If you're a parent, you're going to want to go check that out because every week our kids team is is giving information to to give a link to uh, Discover Kids Online, which if you've not discovered that yet, you're going to want to. Uh, Discover Kids Online, they're doing a kids service every week and and broadcasting that out there. But they're also posting some really exciting uh, things, some things to help you as a parent help your kid really lock down what the big idea of the week is, to help you lock down uh, what the memory verse is, and they're also going to equip you with some questions to be able to engage and interact with your little ones. So make sure you go check that out, at Discover Kids KC on Instagram, and give it a follow so that you can stay in the loop. Now, last week I told you that one of the things that I want to do uh, each week that we're doing this thing together, at Discover Online, is share with you something that I found during the week that was funny. Because here's here's the thing: we, we've got to we've got to be able to laugh still. We've got to find reasons to laugh loud in the midst of it. And so the funniest thing I saw on the internet this week related to the coronavirus was dating tips. Um, and so here's the deal: you know, I I know there's a lot of single folks that are watching. If you're single, let me get a little whoop whoop. Uh, listen, here's the deal. Uh, we've got uh, some dating tips for you. And, and, and before all of this broke out, th- there was three you know, really, really kind of important questions that if you're looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you should be asking. And those three questions included, uh, 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 you know, particularly if you're a lady, you're looking at, at the guy and you're saying, is he stable? Emotionally, physically, is he stable? The second question that you, you probably should be asking is, does he have a good job? Does he have a J-O-B, right? Because you don't want him to be, you know, a sugar daddy uh, having to rely on his sugar mama, right? Uh, and the third question that, that you should probably be asking if you're looking for somebody uh, is, could I see myself married to that person? Those are, those are questions that you should ask. And, um, you know, eventually the world's going to go back to normal. I really believe that. And, and so if you're not asking those questions and you find yourself in bad relationships, then maybe you should put those questions in your back pocket and use them. But, but in the midst of this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 thing that's happening and where the world is kind of frozen, listen, it doesn't mean that you ain't still looking for your soulmate. And so I I saw this week some great questions that you should be asking uh, to try to find your soulmate in this season. And the first one, ladies, that you should be asking is, how many packs of toilet paper can he carry? 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, fellas, come on. You need to work on your curls for girls. You got to do whatever you got to do so that you can carry more packs of toilet paper. And, and maybe you're like, not really, because we can't find any. And that's a whole other issue. Here, here's the second question. Again, I'm just, I, I, Pastor Jay, just trying to help, help you out. Uh, so the second question is, could I see myself quarantined with him? Because I don't know if you know it or not, but marriage is like a lifelong quarantine where you are, you are in it to win it till death do you part. So if you couldn't see yourself quarantined with that person, then, then maybe marriage is not a good idea. And the third question really, and this is really the most important, the most critical. I mean, you, you can throw all the questions that I've already said out the door and just ask this question, and, and this is it. Does he have post-apocalyptic warlord potential? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, th th does he have that potential? Because if he does, you know, then maybe you're starting to feel all right next to him. And if he doesn't, you you probably starting looking for somebody else. And so, listen, hey, listen, I, 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 I don't know if that's translating. Shoot me a message on Instagram. Uh, I don't know if that's translating or not. Just trying to bring some levity to it. Um, or maybe if you see something really funny on the internet this week, man, send it to me on Instagram, at Journey and Schwent. Um, and I love to engage with you and interact with you there. Now listen, I want to dive into the, into the message today, and, and before I do, I want to, uh, I want to just, just draw our attention to a particular verse. If you've been walking with us since the beginning of the year, um, then you know that this verse has served as, as an anchor for us as, as a faith family, as, as a church, um, and it's just been really helpful um, in every season of the year so far. And it's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and, and this is what it says. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You know, it's difficult at times to trust God when things feel very unstable. It would be a lot easier if God would just do what we ask him to do in our prayers. But that's not really how it works. And so God calls us to trust him and to believe in him and to believe um, as we studied this verse at the beginning of the year, that what this means is when it says that he will direct your paths, it means that if you're following him, if you trust in him, then every direction of your path will be good. And that's what God wants for you. And that's what God wants for us. But we've got to trust him. And so I'd love to just open up with a word of prayer as we turn a corner, as we head into the content today. And I want to do so from a posture and a position of trusting God. Matter of fact, I want to ask you to do this right now, um, wherever you're watching, um, unless you're driving, that may not be safe for you to do this while you're driving, in which case you shouldn't be watching and driving this at the same time. You can wait till you get home. But, but I just want to invite you to just open your hands like this. It's a posture that we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, towards the end of the message today. But I just want to get us started like this. Why don't you turn your hands up, put your hands out and pray with me. Jesus, we come to you today and we trust in you. We believe that you have a plan and we believe that your plan is always good. You tell us in your word that you are a good father. And so God, we come to you trusting and believing in you. We do not lean on our own understanding because there's so much we just don't understand. We acknowledge you in this situation that's going on in our world. And we are asking God that you would direct our paths, give us wisdom, Help us to know how to navigate this season and help us to trust in you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. We're going to be continuing in the third part of our series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And the title of the message today is Unite 714. And you're saying that doesn't make any sense to me. Is this a, is this a, are we talking about airline fares? What are we talking about? And, and I promise that that's going to make sense by the time we get to the end of our time together today. And I just want to tell you right up front, I have an agenda. My agenda day, today is, is really simple. I, I'm, I'm calling us, I'm calling you to join me and to join together with our faith family and join together with so many across the world to a call to action of prayer in the midst of this COVID-19 situation. That's my agenda. That's where we're leading to today. And I want to take us to a passage of scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. I'll give you a second to pull that up on, on your phone and pull it up, uh, open your Bible up to that. But 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, this verse is really going to serve as the rallying cry for this call to action that I'm, I'm, I'm calling you to and I'm calling me and us to 
today. And this is what it says, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What an amazing verse. What an amazing promise. What an amazing truth that God has given us in his word. And on the surface of this, what God is, is ultimately doing is he is ultimately calling his people. He's calling humans. He's calling creation to himself. He's calling us to a relationship with him. He's calling us to intimacy with him. That's what he's calling us to. And there's, there's so much packed into this one little verse, and we're going to unpack it today. But before we can really begin to unpack it, what we have to do is we have to go back to the verse that we talked about in Proverbs, where we, we talked about this idea of trusting God, not leaning on our own understanding or our own ability, but trusting in him above all things. Um, can I just tell you that, that there are times in life where it's really simple and it's really easy for me to trust God. I just want to get personal with you. There are, there are things that God tells me in his word that I need to do and I need to trust him in. And it's really, really easy. It's easy for me to trust him when he says, love your wife. Um, that doesn't mean, I, <laughs> Jessica will tell you, um, it, it doesn't mean that I always love my wife perfectly, but it's easy for me to trust him when he tells me that I should love my wife. It's easy for me to trust him when he tells me to, to teach my kids about him. It's easy for me to trust him that it's not a good idea for me to go around killing people. And it's, it's not a good idea to go around stealing stuff that doesn't belong to me. Those things are easy for me to trust in. And, and, and maybe some of those things are easy for you to trust in him. And maybe some of those things are hard for you to trust in him, but he's calling us to trust in him. But then there are times like the situation that we're in now with, with this, this, this virus that's continuing to spread across the globe that it's, it feels really difficult. It feels really hard to trust in him. But that's what he's asking us and that's what he's calling us to do. Here's something that, that, that we can know by simply reading scripture. And if you spend much time reading scripture at all, here's what you will begin to understand. You will begin to see that God has always had a plan. And God's plan has always been to fix what's broken, to heal what is hurting, to rescue and redeem and restore things that have been fractured and torn apart and broken. That's always been God's plan. And the pinnacle of God's plan is ultimately seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the God's plan always involved pain. God's plan always involved brokenness. God's plan always involved hurt. In fact, if it wasn't for the death of Jesus on the cross, then we would never be able to know about the hope that we have in the resurrection. Without the, without the cross, there, there really could never be a story of hope, of, of healing, of, of redemption. And so sometimes part of the plan is God works through the pain and God works through the hope so that, or, or, or through the hurt so that we can experience hope. And I believe that even in the midst of what's happening right now, that God has a plan and that God's plan is good and that God's plan is to heal what's hurting and to fix what's broken and ultimately to bring hope for you and to me and for the whole world. And what we have to understand is that when we're going through difficult and unfortunate circumstances, that it should drive us to a very simple but sometimes hard to walk out principle. And here it is. That in moments when we don't feel like we have control, in moments when we, we don't feel like we know what's going on, in moments when things are difficult or frustrating or feels like it's impossible or hopeless, here is what God calls us to. God calls us to pray first. I know that that doesn't always make sense because sometimes it makes sense. Let's develop a strategy. God says, no, no, no. Before you develop a strategy, pray first. Well, well I, need, I need to go talk to somebody and, and brainstorm. No, no, no. Before you brainstorm, pray first. Well, I need to do research. I, I, I just do some research and figure out what's going on. No, 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 no. 
Pray first. Don't plan. Don't strategize. Don't research. Pray first. That's what God calls us to do because there's something that happens when we begin to pray, when, when we begin to pray to, to the maker of heaven and earth, to the king of the universe, we begin to show ourselves that we are living in a posture of trust. We're saying, God, I recognize my inability. I recognize my insufficiency. God, the whole world is going crazy. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what is true. I don't know what is up and what is down. But God, I trust in you. And because I trust in you, I'm going to pray first. And when we begin to live and model and start with this idea of pray first, then it will lead us to not just pray first, but it will lead us to pray often. Because here's, here's the deal. If we really trust and believe in God, then what it means for us is that we'll understand that there is nothing that will ever fall into our hands that has not first passed through God's hands. I, I want to say that again because, because we need to be reminded and encouraged of this today. That there is nothing that can fall into our hands that has not first passed through God's hands. Now you may be hearing that and you say, Journey, are you saying that, that God caused this virus and this pandemic? And no, that, that's not what I'm saying. Well, then are you saying that God allowed it? Yes, that is what I'm saying. I'm saying that God has chosen to allow this virus because he wants to work for good. God wants to help us see that, that there, there, there are things that he wants to do. And, and, and I believe that because I believe Jesus when he said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, that the enemy's desire is to steal, kill and destroy that means that he wants to steal, kill, and destroy you and me and our lives and our families and our economy and our way of living and our, and our homes and, and all of it. His desire is to light it on fire and watch it go down in flames. That's what the enemy wants to do. But I also believe Jesus when he said in his word that his desire is that he would bring life and life abundantly. And what I believe that that means for you and what I believe that that means for me is that God's desire is that we would trust in him and recognize that as the creator of the universe, he has the power to take anything that is happening in the world that feels devastating, that feels difficult, that feels hard. He wants to take any of those things and all of those things and he wants to work them for good. And here's the difference between our God and the devil, that the devil will take anything that he can, anything that he he can get his hands on any any scraps he can hold on to and use it to twist it and work it and bring devastation and destruction into our lives he'll take anything that he can to make that happen but here's how good and how great and how big our God is that our God doesn't take anything he can get he says I'll take everything that you throw at me devil and I will work it for good <laughs> you see that's how good he is because he has a plan and he can take even the things that the enemy or anybody else intends for evil for us. And he can take it and he can make it good. And we need to be reminded of that today. We also need to be reminded that when we, when we read through scripture that we see that, that, that God is actually motivated by our prayers, that, that, that there is a thing that happens on, on God's side of heaven when we pray that, that spurs him to action when we understand how to pray the right way in these situations. Now, I want to give you some examples of kind of what this looks like. In, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was getting ready to be arrested. He would be crucified and he would die. And we see in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And on three different occasions, back to back to back, this is what he prayed. He said, Father, if it is your will, please let this cup pass from me. 
What is he talking about? He's talking about the cup of, of, of the brutality and, and, and the cup of punishment and the cup of, of torture. But more than that, what he's talking about is the cup of being separated from God the Father. Jesus is revealing his human nature. He's revealing the humanistic side of him, that he is both God and man. And as a man, he is praying, God, I don't want to go through this. But I want you to notice how he finishes his prayer. He says, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. What is Jesus doing? He's modeling for us that it's okay to pray from a, per, a posture and a perspective of confessing something that we don't like, something that we don't want. But he's also modeling the belief and the trust that God, his father, has a plan and his plan is good. And that ultimately the plan all along for Jesus was that he would have to come and live on this earth, that he would have to endure that cross, that he would have to be murdered in order for all of humanity to be able to, through faith in Christ and his death and his resurrection, be able to bypass the wrath of God and be able to receive the relationship and the intimacy and the love of God. God's plan always involved that for Jesus. We see again that Jesus models in Matthew chapter six and what we often call as the Lord's prayer. He, he helps us see that he trusts in God's plan, that God's plan is good. He says, um, um, uh, sorry, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he saying? He's saying, God, I know that your plan and your way and your purposes are perfect and good. And I'm praying and I'm teaching my people to pray that they would pray that their will not be done, but that your will, God, would be done on earth as it is in heaven, because your will happens perfectly in heaven without any obstruction or any anything to get in the way of it. And I'm teaching my people to pray that your will would be done on earth here in the same way that it is in heaven. You see, Jesus is modeling that we pray first and that we trust in God's plan. But I want to share with you how I believe that God is motivated when we pray this way, when we pray trusting in God's plan, that it actually does motivate God to action. There's this amazing story. I want to encourage you to go read it sometime in Joshua chapter 10. In Joshua chapter 10, we find Joshua, the leader of the nation of Israel. He is a, a man of war, a war fighter, and, and he, is being, uh, uh, he, has been, he has been told by God that, that God has a promise. He's going to deliver this promised land to the nation of Israel. Um, and God has told them, hey, you have, you have one job. Drive all of the inhabitants that are in the land. Drive them out because the land belongs to you. And everywhere you go, I'm going to be with you, Joshua. And so what happens is, is there's these five kings in Joshua chapter 10. They hear about the nation of Israel and they hear about Joshua and the works of their God. And so they develop this strategy. They say, hey, listen, we got to find something to do about this because, because if we don't come together, then they're going to come against us and, and push us out. We got to, we got to join forces. And so here's what happens. Joshua uh, gets word that these five kings have attacked uh, one, of the, one of the groups of people that Joshua and the nation of Israel had uh, established a treaty with. They had kind of come to peace terms. And Joshua hears about it. He brings his army and they go to war and they just start annihilating. I mean, they are winning the battle. But Joshua, while in the battle, looks up and notices that the sun is starting to set. And here's what Joshua knows. Because he is a man of war, he knows that if the sun sets, it's really hard to continue to fight the battle. And if the sun sets, then his enemy is going to have an opportunity to be able to retreat and regroup and be able to, to bring back the attack on the next day. And so Joshua does something that seems absurd and it seems ridiculous, but he knew that God had a plan and he knew that God's plan was good. And so here's what Joshua prays in Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. He says, son, stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. He literally is talking to God. He's praying to God and he's saying, God, here's my prayer. My prayer is that the sun would stand still and the moon would stop. I mean, he's literally praying, God, would you, would you stop the cosmos for just a minute? Because we're doing a thing that you've called us to do and we need a little bit more time. 
And notice what it says. And it says this, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. You see, what are we supposed to take away from this? Well, we should take away this idea that when we begin to pray in a way that God will intervene according to his plan, according to his purpose, then when we see our prayers, they, 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 they reach the ears of God in heaven and God becomes motivated to accelerate the plan. You see what I'm trying to, to help you see today and what I believe that God wants us to see today is that we need to pray, but we need to be led to pray in such a way that it encourages God's action today. How do we do that? Well, I, I've been explaining the first part of how we do that, that ultimately we do that by praying with trust in his plan, that we trust him, that we know that God loves us, that God is working for our benefit and for our good, and that God's desire is as he says in 1 Peter, that not that any should perish, but all should come to everlasting life. God is working. Even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, he's working. See, that's the first thing we gotta do. We gotta pray with trust in his plan. But the second thing that we have to do is we have to pray for purity in our lives. Now I wanna take us back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and I wanna unpack this verse. You see, what's happening in this verse is that this is God's response to King Solomon's prayer, dedicating the temple of worship to God that has just been completed. And Solomon has prayed this prayer and he's dedicated the temple to God and God speaks from heaven to Solomon. And this is what he says, verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. Can I just time out just, just for a second? And can I just, I just want to lean in for a second. I just want to encourage you. God hears your prayers. There's never been a prayer that you have ever prayed that God has never heard. Now that doesn't mean that God is always going to respond to your prayers the way that you want him to, but don't allow God's response not being the way that you want it to be serve as any kind of indication that God doesn't actually hear your prayers because he does. He hears your prayers. And that's what he's telling Solomon. Solomon, I hear your prayer. And he says, and I have chosen this place. He's talking about the temple. I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then he says this, verse 13, he says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. All right, this word pestilence literally translated as plague. And so what he's saying is, is, is listen, um, it, 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 for you and me, if we go back and study the Old Testament, these are methods that God would use to get the nations of Israel's, the nation of Israel's attention when they had turned away from him when they had turned to worshiping other gods. And he's saying, listen, when these things happen, here's what I want you to understand. Verse 14, he says, if, now I want to stop right here for if, because I want to, if you'll give me just a minute, I want to geek out on this word, if just a second, because there's so much packed into this one little word, if. Um, if you're, you've been out of school for a while, um, you've probably forgotten about maybe some of your grammar rules and what it looks like for, uh, you know, these conditional phrases, sentences and clauses and all this stuff. If you're in school right now, then you're sitting here going, man, I'm already on this. I already know what's going on. Um, but I, but I want to I want to lean into this word if and, and I want to want to help you understand what's happening because God is using this word if by and he's creating a conditional sentence. In this case, he's he's creating what's called a zero conditional sentence. Now, now you're probably sitting there and I, and I can just picture you right now on your on your couch and you're going, oh, my gosh. Oh, man, zero conditional sentences. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited that we're talking about zero conditional sentences. I've been waiting all day so that I can learn more about zero conditional sentences because of all the sentences, my favorite kind of sentence is a zero conditional sentence. Thank you very much. And I'm sitting here and I'm leaning forward now with my notes and my pen and my paper. Come on, preacher, man. Tell me more about zero conditional sentences. Because what a zero conditional sentence is, for those of you guys who aren't freaking out right now, and if the person to your right or to your left is freaking out, it's okay if you look at them a little weird, because it's a little weird to freak out about that. But it's not weird when you understand what's happening, because a zero conditional sentence is saying, 
is presenting a truth of something that is universal. And it's saying that, that when this condition is met, it automatically creates this reality. So when this happens, it will automatically lead to this thing happening. That's what a zero conditional sentence is all about. And what God is doing right here in his word is he's giving us a zero condition sentence. He's saying, listen, here is the deal. If you do what I'm getting ready to do, then you can bank on my response being what I'm getting ready to tell you my response is. And so I know you're just waiting with bated breath. Oh my gosh, what is, what is the rest of the sentence? And, and so let's dive in and let's see. It says, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray. And I want to stop just for a second because I, I'm, this word humble, this phrase humble themselves is something that I'm worried is going to be lost on us because the idea that they would have heard is probably something very different than what you and I just heard. Because back in olden days, back in the bronze and iron age, what would happen is, is when, when somebody was brought before their king, they would show honor to their king by bowing down and taking a knee. But if you were an adversary, if you were an enemy and you were brought before your enemy king, then here's what you would do. Knowing that the, that king is the only one who has the power to intervene, you would not come in and show honor. You would come in and humble yourself. And what that would look like is, is that they would be brought before the enemy king, the only one with the power to intervene, and they would come in not on one knee, but on both knees. And they would bury their face into the ground and get as low as they could. And they would, they would reach their hands out like this and they would make their case and they would beg for mercy for this king king to intervene and to spare their life, to spare their family, to spare their village and to spare their people. And the king would hear the plea and then he would make a decision for what he was going to do. You see, this is what it means. And this is what God is saying when he says, I want you to humble yourselves. It's not a position of power. It's not a position of strength. It's a position of desperation. And listen to me. God is asking us to be in a position of desperation that we would humble ourselves before our king begging for mercy. And God says, if my people who were called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You see this word, this phrase, turn from their wicked ways is, is ultimately what the word repentance is really all about. It's about recognizing and acknowledging that there's something in my life that's not right. There's something in my life that doesn't line up with God's best that he lays out for us in his word, that there are, there are things where, where I've, been, I've been playing with fire and, and I'm on the verge of getting burned. And God is saying, listen, here's the idea. I don't, I don't want you to tell me that you're sorry for what you did and then choose to stay there in it. What I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to about face and turn away from those things, that you would turn away from these things that I told you are dangerous and are not for your benefit and you would turn away from it and you would turn to me and realize that I have something that is so much better for you. He's saying, if my people, that's anyone on the planet, because we are all God's people, we've been created by him. He says, if my people who are called by my name, those are the people who belong to God through Jesus. You see, that's not everybody. Just because we're all created by God does not mean that we are all um, in relationship with God and we're not all going to heaven where God is. Only if we are called by his name, which is Jesus. If we will humble ourselves, seek his face and pray and turn from our wicked ways. That's the condition. And here's what God is saying. Here's the zero condition sentence. If you will do this, then here's what I will do. Notice what he says. Then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Man, can I just tell you, we, we, we need that. We, we, we need to be in a position of desperation where we are humbling ourselves and turning from our wicked ways and we are seeking his face and praying in desperation. God, would you hear us? Would you forgive us? And would you heal our land? God, we need a miracle. Listen, this is a prayer that anybody can pray. 
because God hears all of our prayers. God, we need a miracle. God, we need you to intervene. And we don't, we don't, we don't exactly know how God's going to do it. So let's just cover all the bases. God, would you intervene by, by helping those who are sick with the virus? Would you help them to become well and to become healed? God, would you intervene by, by being with the medical professionals as they're on the front lines on this deal? Would you help them be well and give them wisdom about how to do what they need to do? God, would you be with the scientists who are in laboratories all across the world right now working hard to find a vaccine and a cure for this? God, would you be with every mayor, every governor, every president, every prime minister, every king, every queen, every person in position of authority to make decisions over people. Would you give them wisdom for the right decisions to make in the right ways? God, would you intervene that, that our way of, uh, of, of our economy wouldn't just totally collapse? Would you intervene and allow us to be able to, to go to work so that we can put food on the table for our families? God, would you intervene, Lord? We need a miracle. You see, anybody can pray. That prayer. And God is calling all of us to pray that prayer. Why? Because God can use everything that is going on and he can turn it for good because his plan is good. His ways are good because he is good. But if you're watching this and you are a follower of Jesus, then I want to I wanna call you into something very specific and very intentional that if you're listening to this and you are a follower of Jesus, then what I want to help you see is that perhaps the most profound thing that you can do in this season to love your neighbor as yourself is to do what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen is saying. That we would recognize that we belong to him, that we would humble ourselves, that we would seek his face, that we would pray, that we would turn from our wicked ways so that God would hear our prayer from heaven, forgive us of our sin, and heal our land. And as we think about praying this way, I want to give you four things that I believe that, that we, we should be praying about. I'm going to use the word pray as an acronym to try to help make this sticky and help make it stick. Because here are four things that I believe that God is calling us to pray for. And the first thing is this, I believe that we need to pray for purification in our lives. That God is calling us to, to turn from our wicked ways. Let me ask you, it, it, or let me help you see that it's possible that in this time of quarantine, that the, the, the business of it is really all for the purpose of stripping all of that stuff away so that all we can see is Jesus. And in the midst of that, let me ask you some question. Is there any area of sin in your life that you need to confess? Is there any area where you have been sacrificing your character or your integrity? Is there any area where you have, you had a standard in your life, but you've been creating excuses and allowing different things to justify why you are slipping off of that standard? Are there any, any areas in your life where you've been flirting with danger, but you've been ignoring it? Let me ask you this. Are there any habits that you know that God has been leading you to break, but you've been pushing it off? Or on the flip side of that coin, are there some new habits that would, that would bring life to your soul and, 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 and bring hope to you that God has been leading you to start, but you have been putting them off? You see, I believe that God is calling us to pray for the purification of our souls. The second thing I believe that God is calling us to pray for is reminders of God's goodness. That we need, to, we, we need to be reminded of his goodness. When I was a little kid, I would go to church with my great-grandmother. We lived in a small town in Arkansas, and it, wasn't, uh, it, it was really common uh, that when we would walk into church this morning, you would introduce yourself, and then there would be this back and forth of this statement where they would say, God is good, and then, and then you would say, all the time, and then they would say, all the time, and then you would say, God is good. And man, can I tell you, sometimes it's really hard to remember just how good God really is. It's hard to remember the things that he does. But it's in these times of uncertainty that we need to be reminded of God's goodness all the more. And here's the reason why I believe with all my heart that for you and for me, the credibility of God's offer of hope for the future is found in the consistency of his faithfulness in the past. 
that when we can remember the consistency of his faithfulness, then it will enlarge in our faith to believe in him for something that is better, to believe in the hope that he has for you and for me. And so let me encourage you. Where are the things and the places and the ways that God has been faithful to you in the past? Where has God intervened for you? Maybe it would be helpful for you to write those things down and put them somewhere where you can see them so that you can be reminded of God's goodness. Here's the third thing I think that we need to pray for. We need to pray for assurance of God's power. We need to pray for assurance of God's power. It's so easy to forget the ways that God moves and works in our lives. And it's easy to allow the present situation to cloud our ability to remember just how mighty and strong and powerful our God is. You know, my pastor always puts it this way, that if we can explain it, then God didn't do it. And so I want to invite you, won't you look back over your life? What are the unexplainable things that God did? Was it the way that you met your spouse? Was it how you got pregnant? Was it um, how you got the job? How you got the interview? How you landed the house? I don't know what it might be for you, but what's the unexplainable thing that can't be explained apart from God? And won't you be reminded and remember by also writing those things down so that you can be reminded just how powerful our God is. And lastly, I believe that we need to pray with a yearning for God's presence. Man, our lives are so busy and so hectic. Well, at least they used to be. Maybe the greatest gift of all to you in this season of quarantining and social distancing is that maybe God wants to use this so that you will not be filled with anxiety and worry about all the things that could be. And that God is actually giving you an opportunity to clean the calendar and to clear the slate so that you can be reminded that Jesus, the King of the universe, has made a promise to you that He will always be available to meet with you. That He will always be available to give you encouragement when you need it. To give you hope in dark days. To give you wisdom in difficult and uncertain times. That God Himself has promised you that He's cleaned His calendar for any time that's available for you. And may you... And may I and may we in this season take advantage to simply yearn for his presence, to taste and see that he is good. And so I believe that God is asking us, he's asking you, he's asking me to pray like this. And so here is the call to action. I told you at the beginning I had an agenda. And here's the call to action that I'm inviting us into. And the first thing is this, that you would join me and hundreds of thousands of other people in a global movement called Unite 714. It's based off this verse in 2 Chronicles 714. Um, And you can go to the website, unite714.com, and you can register yourself and you can find some resources there and you can join and you can see across the globe where other people are praying. And you can unite in this effort to come to God to humble ourselves, to seek his face, to turn from our wicked ways and pray that he would heal our land. Basically, the commitment, you can find some things, some directed things, some prayer in the resources tab, but essentially the commitment is that every day at 7.14 in the morning and 7.14 in the evening that you will pray this prayer and that you will pray for God to intervene, you will pray for a miracle, and you will pray for God to move and God to work. And I'm asking you, would you join me? Go register yourself, go register your family, and let's join the work that's happening around the globe in this. But the second call to action is this. I'm asking you to join me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week from 1230 to one. We're going to create a video conference link and we're going to get that link out to you. We're going to create a video conference link. Follow us on social media. We'll make sure that you got it. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, I'm asking, would you consider joining me on that video conference? I'll be there. And maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I'm asking all of us that are watching this right now, come join us and let's join together in prayer as a family, as a people who were called by his name 
and we're going to pray and we're going to have a directed prayer and follow us on social media because we're going to put these things out Monday through Thursday and what these things are. We're going to give you some verses that you can be reading and championing and holding on in your life. We're going to give you a song of worship that, that you can listen to that day that will serve as a, a motivation and anthem in your soul as we are collectively pointing our hearts to God in the same direction together from 1230 to one every afternoon, Monday through Thursday of this week. And listen, I really believe that we're going to get through this because I believe that God is good and I believe that God has a plan. And I believe that in this time we have an opportunity to shine and show the love of Jesus in profound ways. And part of his plan is you and me getting our hearts reset and focus back on Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord, I come to you today and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that's found in it. I pray, God, that you would encourage us today, that we would be motivated to action, that we would hear and do what you've set before us, God. I, we are praying for a miracle. We are praying for medical professionals and scientists and community leaders and, and people in positions of power and influence and authority. God, that, that, that you would use and work and move in all of this, God, that you would bring good out of it, that you would bring healing to those who are ill. And God, I pray that, that in this, that the message of Jesus would go far and wide and that the message of hope would be clearly heard in every corner of the world. Thank you for everybody that's tuning in, that's doing their part to wash their hands, cover their mouth, stay at home, all of that. But God, I pray that they can see that they can do more. Not only to do their more in, in the opposition of this virus by praying, but that they can do a powerful thing to love their neighbor as their self. That if they belong to you, Jesus, if they're walking with you, that they would call to you turn from their wicked ways, come to you in prayer, and that you would move, that you would be activated just as you activated the cosmos when Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. God, we are praying for you to intervene in this situation, not just for the virus, but for all of the economic impacts and all of the financial impacts and all of the, 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 the relational impacts. God, we're asking that you would intervene, that you would speak hope in the midst of the, ca the, 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 the chaos and the panic and that we would be able to see you at work. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you're tuning in today and um, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm so glad that you chose to watch us. I'm so glad you chose to join us for this today. And I just wanna encourage you that, it, that if you're here today and your, your foundation of hope has been shaken, because of everything that's going on in the world, I just want to encourage you that God loves you and that you don't have to come to God by, by getting your life right first, that, that you actually just come just as you are. Matter of fact, I want to share a really encouraging verse, Romans chapter five and verse eight. And God's word says is that God demonstrated his own love towards us. That's me and that's you. That while we were still sinners, before we cleaned ourselves up, before we got everything together, while we were still sinners, Christ demonstrated his love towards us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died. And he died for you so that you can have hope, so that you can have peace, and so that you can have a life that God designed you to have. And so if you're here today and you want to begin a new relationship and experience life in Christ, then I want to invite you to pray this prayer of faith. There's nothing magical about the words. It's all about the posture of your heart. And you would repeat after me. You would say, dear Jesus, I admit I can't do this on my own. I need help. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that he rose from the grave. And because he rose from the grave, I can have hope and I can discover what life is really all about. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior. And I declare with my mouth that I make you the Lord. You are the boss. In Jesus' name, amen.
And I just want to tell you, if you prayed that prayer of faith today, I'm so excited for you. We would love to celebrate with you and, and to know who you are and, and to connect with you. Um, we'd love to be able to send some things your way that would be an encouragement for you. If you prayed that today, I want to invite you to, to text the word faith, just faith, nothing else, just faith to this number, 816-203-1835. And our team is going to follow up with you and engage with you and encourage you on this new journey of faith. As we wrap up today, I, I want to invite you to an opportunity. I asked our worship team to, to, to do this, and it's a song that's it's very, very old. It's a song that God reminded me of this week that has been just kind of an anthem in my heart that God has just used to remind me of what the most important thing is. And so I want to invite you, as, as, our, as our worship team sings this song, I want to invite you, maybe you would sing it out loud. Maybe you just need to allow the lyrics of this song to just resonate deep in your soul. Maybe you need to come back and listen to it again. But I want to invite you to just be reminded of the beautiful truth of this song. And then it would serve as a point of encouragement for you to allow this situation to rearrange and to reorganize your priorities so that you can see the fullness of God's love and grace and mercy for you. I love you, and thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. For worshiping with us today. If you began a relationship with Jesus for the first time, we would encourage you to text FAITH to the number on your screen. First, we want to be able to celebrate with you this decision that you've made today, and we want to provide you with some resources as you begin your relationship with Jesus. Also, don't forget to head over to Facebook and engage in some discussion questions. We're going to have the rest of our online community over there talking about what they learned and their takeaways from today's message. So do not forget to head over there. 
Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you right back here next week. Have a great week.